Hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Braverman. And I'm Ellen Selm. Happy New Year, everyone. This New is Year. our this is our first podcast of 2022. There's a lot of twos in there. So welcome to Stories from the Earth. <laughs> we explore mankind's relationship and connection with the natural world. We would like to take a quick moment to invite our listeners to consider supporting us through a humble little donation. You can go to our anchor page and click the support button for $1, $5, or $10. And the donation goes towards helping us with future projects, such as launching our herbal education curriculum. We've dubbed the People's Herb School, as well as funding to help take the show on the road and do some on-site reviews and interviews at herb farms and schools and other interesting places. Today, we're going to be talking with Lori Burra, founder of Green Heart Gardens in Candler, North Carolina, which is just outside of Asheville. Lori was a graduate from the local nonprofit organic grower school with their farm beginnings year long farmer training program. And she took what she learned there and ran with it, developing her own successful medicinal herb farm, supplying materials to other brands and formulators, as well as her own product creations and achieving organic certification status for her property. Lori's work is guided by being in communion with the plant spirits or devas which inspire unique mandala designs in the garden planning and more. Lori has additionally been a guest speaker and teacher for Organic Grower School and other events here in the Southeast. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and describe how you got interested in pursuing a more formal and professional path with medicinal herbs. When I was um, seven, I actually contracted a brain disease and I was in a coma for 10 days. When I came out of it, they brought me back a couple of times. Also, when they when I came out of it, I had all my thoughts, but nothing worked like a stroke victim thinks they're talking, but nothing's happening. And I was fortunate enough to have a wise woman grandmother. So when the doctor said put her on a feeding tube and say goodbye, um, she smacked him. He was also her cousin. So she knew him, but um, she brought me home and the next day she literally had me in the garden with my hands in the dirt and my grandmother didn't know how to raise grass. So everything was like either medicine or food or flowers to give away to people, you know, for pollinators. Um, as it happens, where my grandparents were from in Europe was a few towns away from Steiner, Rudolf Steiner. Wow. And a lot of the things he did, they all just did. Huh. So some of the herbs, I mean, not burying things in, in cow parts and dirt, but, you know, how to fertilize and things like that. So that was like, I was raised on this stuff. Yeah. Um, I went the corporate way for a couple of, for a bunch of years. And then once I started having kids, I just was like, wait a minute, I'm not giving them this stuff. I also, although I, I gave them immunizations, I made them do one at a time and I fed them like vitamins and We've been a big proponent of nettles in our house for many, many, many years. So I would build their immune systems, you know, in between shots. And I would make a deal with the school nurse, like, I'm going to keep taking them. But, you know, they I made them break up the shots. So it took a lot longer. Um, so I just, you know, always had gardens, was, uh, you know, always just raising medicines and using it as part of um, a way of life for us. Um, we moved to Western North Carolina. Um, because of the trade center. My husband was supposed to be in it. I freaked out. I was like, let's get out of here. So we came down. I guess we've been living here now almost 13 years. The gardens kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. And <laughs> we we have like a five acre meadow and 10 acres of wood. So, nice. you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so much uh, space to play in. So I met Janine Davis with the, uh, it was a horticultural research station. She's in charge of non-traditional plants. So we learned about medicinal plants and how to process them, the laws about, you know, making medicines and labels and the proper way to dry things. And I just kept showing up and showing up and showing up and, or they'd have a day where they needed help. Like before they had the machine to harvest the hops they put a call out and I, I just I say yes as much as possible because there's so many people there to learn from and then one day she had a buyer seller like if you're a grower seller and I was even too shy to go up to anybody to say oh would you buy from me I was kind of freaked out like you know me 
But then I had all this calendula and I called Jeannie Dunn over at uh, Red Moon Herbs. Would you buy some calendula for me? You know, and Janine gave me a reference. And so the first year I, I sold uh, like five pounds of calendula. Awesome. Red Moon Herbs is now walking distance to me. They moved up the street. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. The Church of the Holy Basil is right here. So she had a couple other people. Then she had another day where this guy came in with King Bio, who was looking for growers who needed to be certified organic to provide him with plants for his homeopathic products. And I had a couple more talks with them. And I talked with uh, Jeannie, sort of helped them set this up. And I actually became the largest grower for King Bio that there was. The FDA has since shut him down. I don't know the story. He's getting his legs back under him. I just learned that the other day from a rep, actually. So he's, well, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up uh, contacting you again at some point. That would be cool because he pays way better than anybody else. So my, my claim to fame in the world is my organic poison ivy that I was growing for him. I mean, the only organic poison ivy in the United States. <laughs> You laugh. I was making like five thousand yeah. dollars a year harvesting poison ivy leaves for him. All and, gloved up, I assume. <laughs> oh, special clothes, special uh -huh. gloves. Oh um, my god! Special screens because I didn't want the leaves touching other screens. You know, I had just some patches of it, and then I started cultivating it, and um, it was a good test for interns. <laughs> The poison ivy. So I found the customers first, and it kind of went from there. So your herbal yeah. botanical education, clearly some came just through your grandmother and your upbringing. Some of it came through, like, connections with um, Janine Davis and stuff like that. Have you done any um, particular, like, courses or anything like that on herbs specifically, or it's all just this accumulation? Well, I haven't done a specific, you know, program. But I started going to conferences 30 years ago, and I always make sure to take intensives. Mm -hmm. So, um, excuse me, I've studied with some of the best, you know, obviously Rosemary Gladstar, David um, Winston, David Hoffman, Brian Drum. Robin Rose Bennett is one of my favorite teachers. So she cracked my egg so far. You know, I had gone all the way into the corporate world, so now I had to figure out, you know, how to come back. And so Robin Rose, at a, in a formal class, and, you know, we sat around and put some leaves in our hands and said, okay, sit with this, and then you tell me what it does. And it was like, oh, okay, I can do that. I pick it back. I did do a, a program um, for a year. This woman... Um, who was pretty cool, Pika Trenko is her name, and she moved into homeopathy, and she did, we went to her house once a month, we all had babies, so in the mornings we would learn about the systems and the chemicals of the systems and the after, and, and, and all the things that companies were doing to screw us up, we'd get very depressed before lunch, then we'd have a, a potluck lunch, feed the babies and get them back to sleep, and we talk about the herbs for the systems of the body. But I, you know, I have a notebook with that stuff, but it didn't like stick. Mm. So then once, you know, I learned, oh, I can sit with the plant. That stuff I remember, you know, that's the way I learn. Yeah, yeah. You have to figure out the best way to learn. But I really loved going to conferences and, you know, seeing different teachers approaches and learning that way. It was, oh, and books. I mean, you know, when I'm working with somebody, I will usually use my intuition but then, um, as Pika warned me, check it in the book and make sure, you know, there's not a contraindication that you are getting to what you thought. And it always is, you know, it always is. But, you know, I, I do have resources that I use just in case. And there's certain herbs I just don't touch. You're not going to have a Fedra here. I don't grow anything that's too harsh. I wanted to, to go back to the guy who you guys mentioned was influencing your grandmother, great grandmother? My uh, um, yeah. Um, was my he cousin, doing... the neurosurgeon? <laughs> no, no, no. The the uh, the one in the village. The um, is it the biodynamic? Oh, guy? Steiner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to to clarify for everyone who who maybe isn't less familiar, but so he is okay. He's the the father. Is the father of biodynamic. Biodynamic. Well, we're not going to get into it, but everyone look up biodynamics. It's 
it's very interesting. <laughs> it is so. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I borderline it. You know, I'm not a true devotee, but I do use some of it. What year did you get into funding and running a farm? And how did that come about? So how did your, I guess maybe you talked about it a little bit, but how did you decide to do a farm? Well, my husband said, we have all this land, go find a way to make some money with it. <laughs> I was threatened, you know, we're either moving and selling or we're going to do something with this. Then we found out we already had a farm number. Oh, it's really important to register with the feds for things like that because you get a lot of interesting emails <laughs> and um, as for grants and things, it makes it, you know, it makes you more official. So it was a combination of that and um, getting bigger when I started working with King Bio and then taxes. He does all the paperwork stuff. So he went to a seminar about it and we became an official business. It was about, I think it was like seven years ago, six or seven years ago, oh. coincided with the organic certification because mm -hmm. I needed that for King Bio. I thought it was very interesting when you said that you got the customers kind of before you got the products, I guess, to sell them. And that, that I thought that was very interesting because when, when I you know think about business, you're like, well, how does that happen? Do you get, you know, do you have the product first? Do you have the customers first? And that I guess neat. that probably helped dictate what you were going to focus on growing, right? You just found out what they needed and pivoted to that. Um, I, yeah, I asked a lot of questions. I mean, I was growing stuff for me anyway. But like, how do I know what to grow? You know, what are people mm -hmm. looking for? You know, what am I going to use? Uh, but also, you know, we weren't depending on this as our income either. So I had a little bit of a luxury to do that. At first it was playing. When I first started, I was working with homeless veterans. And I um, went over to the um, veterans healing quarters. There's like a hotel that they stay at. And I worked up a crew and I would, you know, pay them and feed them and teach them. Um, and we were trying to get that as a whole thing. But being that neither my husband or I are veterans, we just couldn't get funding. And <laughs> we were going broke paying with our own money, you know, <laughs> feeding them. So after three years, we kind of had to stop that, you know, and we moved more into the, the woofer stage, you know, for help. That was better for us. But... Yeah, finding customers first was much easier for us. So farming is definitely always something full of all sorts of challenges. What have been some of your biggest challenges that you faced in this process of getting launched and having it as a thriving business? Well, nature first. <laughs> nature first. I would probably say nature first, second, third, fourth. Well, A, on the bright side, I have bottom land, which means my soil's topsoil. Why is my soil topsoil? Because I have a creek that overruns periodically. And it brings the mineral-enriched, you know, soil onto the farm. So it makes growing really easy. It's beautiful, beautiful. I mean, I've gone down three, four feet. It's all topsoil wow. until you get to near the house where it's clay. Um, but sometimes I do bring that down. I'm also in a rain pocket. So the last three years, it's rained, judging from my hemp, every day except for maybe three or four days in hemp growing season. I've had rain. Wow. And so, A, I don't have to irrigate, but I use probiotics. And probiotics get sprayed on the undersides of the leaves. So it's kind of hard if it's going to be raining and, like, come right off, you know. So timing things, mm -hmm. you know, is hard. With the hemp, it's very hard. I've been doing clones. I'm real small on the hemp side, you know. Last year, we only did like 50 plants. I only do what I can use. The price of it is just... To say that it plummeted is an understatement. You know, the five years ago, I was offered like $120 a pound. And last year, it was down to like 10 Ooh. And, you know, that's crazy. <laughs> so... I grow what I use, you know, I'm not looking to sell it. So, um, you know, weather's one thing. Um, <laughs> I would say animals, but I don't grow things that, that like, that the, um, 
mm. squirrels and rabbits would eat. Um, I did spend two years, I found the animal trail in the woods and I spent two years putting apples and greens down the trail further away to my neighbors. So I trained them off my land, which has been pretty good. So I don't really see signs. The only problem I had is when we had the flooding this summer, the fence came down and some of my neighbor's calves kept coming and eating. Um, but that's okay because I couldn't use those, those, you know, I couldn't use that anyway. And they were nice enough to poop outside of the gardens and not inside them. So, um, I guess that's, if they, I was thinking like, oh, free manure, but I guess if they had done that, it could have messed with the organic status, right? Well, it's still, I mean, once, once we had the flood, I couldn't use anything that was left. I, I mean, I'm thinking I'm growing medicine and I have a really good reputation. I don't know what's in the water. So anything that the water touched, well, on the bright side, I got a lot of seeds for things that I never would have seeded, you know, for next year. Um, the root stuff, I'm going to move around the house. Although somebody said to me, one of my other mentors said, if you think about it like poop and it's, you give it 120 days, then you can still sell it and use it. But, you know, I'm thinking what it should have, could have, I don't know. So I'm probably going to take like some of the, the echinacea and the valerian and, like at the base of the house and stuff, make the gardens where I didn't have them before. And, you know, I took a lot of seeds out of things. So, um, kind of bring it closer to the house for convenience sake or even just for this expansion? Just to be pretty. I have a daughter getting married this spring, in the middle of planting season. It was so nice of her. <laughs> Is she going to do um, it there on your property? No, um, this daughter has only been on the actual grass twice. She's she's not into nature. Hey, she's she's about to become a a, a doctor of physical therapy, so wow. she has her uses. You know, she'll be very handy <clears throat> for this old farming body. <laughs> I went back to try vegetables again. I'm not going to grow food. I don't know what it is about food, but it's just not my specialty. And I had this whole garden for food and I didn't do it my usual way. I just like went and got the seeds in. And when that didn't work, I covered it with fabric and I made a seeding area. And so this winter we're building a gazebo, oh. you know, so at least 10 people can sit in it. So I'll be able to do classes and things. And if it's raining, you know, shady, so we'll, we'll have a spot. Um, but anyway, well, I'm th factors. So I'm saying back to nature. So I'm always looking at, you know, I, rain is such a huge factor here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm lucky because from farm beginnings, learning about soil, I didn't know the, the textures of soil and things. So I'm constantly watching the water, you know, and it, where it's sitting, where it's not sitting and things like that. Um, so that that's a huge factor. The animals, and I, I dealt with that already. Um, there's no fences here around anything. I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, so I told the animals, you leave the, the plants alone. If you need their medicine, I will help you, but you got to let it grow. <laughs> and like the Bible, I believe animals get, you know, get their 10%. I should say, please like get it from the one at the end. Like don't take a little bit off of all of them. Like, you know, let them still be pretty please. And sometimes that works. Sometimes it, you know, it doesn't. I do a bunch of companion planting to help with some of the critters. And also, um, I guess help is a factor because at certain times of the year, I need more help than others. The other thing was we, out, I outgrew my drying facility, which was my son's old bedroom. And it was just, it was too much. The house was just, the overage was in the living room and stuff was hanging everywhere at certain times of the year. It gets a little crazy here, but we bought one of those containers that Somebody that had been in the hemp business and, and left it was looking to get rid of fast. Ah. So it still had, you know, the wheels and the base to move it here. It was insulated. It has electricity. It did, you know, it was really ready to roll. We had to make some changes for the organics. And with that, my husband's friend who helped us with it, we made a wall that moves. So the area for drying can change. Oh, wow. That's I cool. don't have to heat it, you know, or cool it too much of it at a time. It depends, you know, what I need. So I have the luxury of that, which is really would have been helpful had I had things to dry this the year. Whole 
like um like shipping container size structure? It's a shipping container. The wall starts at about I mean I can have a little more than half or three quarters of the container for drying if I want or not. You know, and I can move the wall um, if I don't need that much space. It depends that what I need. Probably a big uh, game changer to obtain that, wasn't it? Oh, it was wonderful. And it was so inexpensive. I was so lucky. That was awesome. That was definitely a, a, a good deal for, for, you know, it was good for the the guy. As soon as I saw it online, it's like, I'll take it. I'll be right there. And he's like, oh, I sold. He sold it five times before he got to me. Everybody crapped out on him. Wow. And then it finally got, I kept praying, you know, come on. It's my trailer. I need it. It's mine. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges for anybody trying to get into medicinal growing to a bulk enough quantity for saleability would be just being able to dry it properly. I mean, that's huge. So very cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I had a, I had the bedroom, I guess was bigger than the space that I have now, but I don't usually, I don't need that much at one time. You know, I'm not doing that much hemp. I'm not, you know, at one point, 1500 plants here that's not happening again <laughs> you know i had two partners and on that's not happening again either <laughs> well going back to hemp you were not one of the first farms in our region to be farming hemp that is organically certified so just can you talk about a little bit more about your hemp experience um sure well we were, I was told I was like the first in North Carolina, but I don't know that there's a way to check that out, but I was Oregon tilts first. So, wow. um, yeah, it was really funny because I had to kind of help them because they didn't know much about it. And I had to keep telling them about the laws and, you know, showing I was permit 307 in North Carolina, which went way over 2000, I believe. Um, but anyway, so First year, I really didn't know much. I've not been um, a cannabis grower before. I've not been in a legal state. I've not played with growing cannabis before. Or um, actually went out to Arizona and California visiting my son and some friends. And they sent me to farmers who were doing no-till cannabis. So I got to study firsthand from people once I knew I was doing it. Um, so first of all, we're a no-till so we went and rented a uh, skid steer tractor, you know, that you stand on and you just drive it up mm -hmm. with a um, drill and a bit. And we made holes. And then we we took the stuff in the hole. We had like a little a nine inch bit. This is because I didn't know that um, clones don't generally send down a tap root. Clones mm -hmm. go out more than down. And so... I didn't know this, but I had never farmed him. It was a, it was a grass pasture, but I wouldn't put the chemicals on it that my neighbors wanted. They wanted me to spray stuff, you know, for their hay and I didn't want to do it. I said, here's the equivalent of the organic stuff. And they didn't want it. So, you know, I had this field that nobody wanted the hay from. So I was looking for what to do. So we took half the dirt that we came out of the holes. We mixed it in with um, compost and worm castings and then planted in that. We made, you know, we literally took tape measures out, Mark Rose um, with it. And um, <laughs> we got 20 inches of rain the first two weeks that we after we planted oh my God. It was crazy. And again, I didn't. So I went back to uh, my training with the scientists over at the um, Janine and the, the Horticultural Center and I started to chart. I made a big chart of the field, and there were three categories of um, the water and how much water was sitting in the holes, how long it was sitting, and the other one was how long was it sitting there, how well was the plant doing. So I got to learn the sweet spots mm -hmm. until I realized there was one real high spot, and I've since learned that there's a rock, there's a huge boulder underneath over there. So the water table, you know, because that's what happens here when it rains, the water comes, oops, where's the camera? The water comes up and it comes down. So I get it both ways. So it was good to learn the field. And um, we cloned a bunch. We ended up with about 1,500 plants. It was, it was kind of interesting. 
Then I found out um, it seemed in the hemp world there's a whole dichotomy between indoor and outdoor. Mm-hmm. Like people want it. outdoor tastes so much better. I have won every contest, smoking contest. My t- my stuff tastes so fresh um, and clean and just. I, I've won like four or five of these contests already, but the buds aren't like these tight buds. They're not these huge, big, tight buds. So that's why I gave up on by the pound. I wasn't competing. Um, and there's also um, a huge misogyny in the world, you know, like being a woman growing um, in the hemp world. There's a couple of people who are um, doing well, but they're also more at the business end. They're not necessarily the growers. And so that was one thing I had to deal with. So mostly I work with women in general. The second year with the hemp, oh, back to the first year, we had a hurricane that year. We had 60 mile an hour winds. And my partners were like all freaked out. I work with nature. I did my thing. I got it set. And honestly, I had a 120 foot red oak fall right on the field. And my partners came running the next day, freaking out. I lost half of one plant. Yeah, that was it. Storm. Yeah, I have pictures of of my stalk standing in between the the branches as they fell. It was so great. It was so great. So the next year, there was a hurricane that didn't quite make it here. It made it to I think Charlotte, but not here. But we got winds, and all of a sudden, there's worms all over my plants. I'm like what on earth is going on? I was like freaking out, and again, I worked with nature. I lost about a third of the the really good buds in a week. Oh no! There's no worm. I think it came from the wind and the hurricane. There were no worms on the ground. There was no sightings of worms. None of the buds on the lower ends of the plants were touched. So I'm pretty convinced it came in on the wind. However, worms travel. There's like eggs that, you know, bird droppings or something. Um, but I worked with nature and did some flower essence treatments. And the next day, th- the damage that was there was there, but it progressed no further. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. My dogs are pretty good about staying out of the gardens. When I work with nature, a lot of things that farmers deal with, I don't have to worry about so much. Because nature takes care of it for me. You know, weather's a tough one. So I weather's- guess it sounds like... Uh, as far as your foray into hemp, though, par- in large part because of um, how quickly the market had the boom and bust, you've kind of downsized that part of the operation over the last couple of years. Absolutely. But also, you know, um, we put together a group of hemp cro- local hemp growers to help each other out. And Janine Davis, again, from this, you know, she does research on growing hemp. Um, times of the years of planting, water, you know, uh, inputs, things like that. And she said from day one, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. And I also took that to heart. It's good, good advice. I mean, that's good advice on any farming, you know, very, very wise words to live by that a lot of people didn't. Yeah. You know, a lot of people did excited and went all crazy with it. And but I, I just the hemp medicine is really interesting. The species that I tend to concentrate on are high in um, CBDA, like the anti-inflammatory things, because I'm really convinced that a lot of problem comes from inflammation. I'm of that school. I've been a Reiki master. I studied. Uh, well, coming out of the coma, I could always find people. It was like a magnet for me. Like, I would see where people were hurting. I could just see it and touch them. And I'd get, like, a jolt, and they'd be like, whoa, I'm fine, you know? And years of reading people, I just totally saw inflammation. It's just something that comes to me all the time. So I decided to specialize in that. One of the strains that I really love, and I don't know anybody else, was these auto twos. In the hemp world, the Russians have been at the forefront. The Russians and the Israelis, but I'm talking about the Russians because it goes back to the revolution. Did you know that when the people came from England, they had to grow um, like 20 hemp plants, fiber Hmm. to go back to England because Uh, that's what they used to make, like the sails from the boats, you know, fabric. People were so dependent on it. 
this auto two stuff comes from Russia because it doesn't have to do with the sun, the hours of sunlight, but rather days in the ground. Oh. So growing that many plants, it helped me scatter my harvest. So I didn't have to harvest everything at once. That's cool. And harvesting a thousand plants. Is... <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I can't even. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Well, it never happens all at once. So. Have you generally stuck with that variety then? Well, that's what I couldn't find them organically last year. I was able to get away a little bit more because it, this, the business was so young. There really weren't organic clones to be had. Mm -hmm. So after fighting with Oregon Tilt for a couple of months, I can't find them. You know, I, here's like 30 people. Nobody has them. They finally said, okay. So now I have to buy my clones from organic people. And I don't buy enough seeds to, to uh, you know, just get the seeds. But um, the hemp has allowed me a side business. I help other farmers with their organic paperwork. So a whole bunch of the larger hemp farms around here, I've helped with their paperwork for their organics. So I have a way to get it. Nice. So, and I got to send them to Oregon Tilt so that, because it was, wasn't, that many people for the, the inspectors were coming from all over the country, you know, and you have to pay for that. So it made it a lot cheaper for me to get every, to get more people involved. Yeah. To get more people. Right. And it's funny because as it went on, I raised my prices and cause all of my customers were male. So it was my sexism tax. <laughs> <laughs> Treat me like that. That's fine. You're paying for it. You know, <laughs> So um, that was how I made myself feel better doing it. it, it it's funny because I'd be in meetings and they'd all go to one or two people asking questions. And it's like, but they're coming to me for the answers. Like I could have been a chair in the room. Oh my it God. was so funny. That's and that's awesome. when I decided, you know, let's, let's up the rates. Yeah. So I was wondering what caused the market to crash? Um, too much was grown without uses for it. Really? Um, I, that's what I think. I mean, people were growing, huh? like oh, yeah. major that's acreage without, how do you grow 10, 15, 20, a hundred acres of something you've never grown before? So one of the farms that I worked with, it was so funny. Cause at first, you know, people didn't want to talk about what they were doing or how they were doing it. And I was very free with my information. So this other guy starts telling me what he's doing, shows me his property he shows me he got a container and how he's setting it up for drying. And I went, okay, that's good. And what else are you doing? And he said, what do you mean? I said, okay, let's do some math. How many plants did you show me out there? And you're going to break them up. You figure how many branches per plant, you know, we went into like nice round numbers and how many do you think are going to fit in there? And he was like, holy shit. <laughs> So, you know, people were not prepared or they went into the barns to dry them like they dry tobacco, but it was too moist, mm -hmm. you know, and hemp molds real quickly. Yeah. So that's why I use the probiotics to help with the, you know, any moisture issues because it takes up the spaces on the leaves and the cells where things would come in that you don't want in there, like mold. For four years in a row, I sent my stuff out to this one lab and... It was really funny because when I would talk to somebody in the lab, they wouldn't believe me when I told them this was out, outdoor stuff. Wow. My numbers were so low. They were like, how did you do that? And I told them and they're like, oh, that makes sense. But, you know, people didn't want to take the time to, to, to you know, learn what they were doing and, and to dry them properly. And it was the Wild West, you know. It, it reminded me of the computer stuff in the early days of PCs. Mm-hmm. You know, people spent a lot of money investing and didn't know what they were doing. And to me, it was just another plant. You know, yeah. talk to me. Tell me what you need. Is the market maybe something that could grow bigger, but like at the time, it maybe people did people just jump on it too fast and it wasn't quite ready? Because there's, I know there's a lot of uses for hemp and then also this it's just very plant. saturated. Yeah. Well, oh, okay. Too many people if you grow. look at North Carolina as a state that I consider quasi recently got a lottery, the idea of cannabis, you know, and getting the rules and the protections. And, you know, I mean, I can go into the whole history. It's, it's such crap. 
the reason it's not legal. It really doesn't. Yeah. It's not logical at all. But, you know, it's prevented us from learning about it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the problem. I was watching TV before and you look at these commercials. This 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 pill can do this this, you know, they tell you all the stuff it can do. Oh, and it can cause death. But, you know, two people get sick from a plant and it's off the market. Right, exactly. It's kind of crazy. So that's the other thing is, you know, if there's not a way for the big companies to make money, there's not really anybody in there. Well, oh, God, I forgot his name. There, There is a small organization in North Carolina that's been in there working with the legislatures and whatnot. Um, THC Cannabis, as, as far as I know, has gotten out of one committee. But they're not going to let people like me with experience in growing it grow because they they won't be companies with you know right. police dogs and stuff out there. They're not going to you know let me do it. So even if they legalize it finally, they're going to elbow out Control all the growers. The, yeah, they where can. if they didn't do that, it could be a real good opportunity for you know a bunch of people in the state. Never mind. Never mind the fact of how many people could it help. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I mean, that's the goal, you know, the goal isn't making money. The goal is helping the people. And I know that a lot of people find it helpful because, you know, I talk to people all the time. My dogs have been getting hemp oil, not as a concentrate. I also don't overprocess it. I, um, like my stuff's not going to say like 500 milligrams. I just take the plant. I do the wise woman approach, make it in an oil, make it in, you know, with vodka, things like that. My dogs get it in their food twice a day. They're getting older and they run a lot. And I just see a difference in them running around. We'll put it on our food. Uh, Don't tell my husband he's been getting it. He doesn't know. (laughs) Can't listen to this part of the podcast. (laughs) uh, We'll see, you know. (laughs) Well, he went from you're crazy with all this, all the herb stuff to disbelief, but, you know, okay, I'll try it to taking stuff every day i'm sneaking some ashwagandha in with his ginseng now but it's better than four cups of coffee he feels an effect and then you go by the way (laughs) maybe maybe i don't know i doubt it he trusts me though you know so it's okay suspended disbelief that was his middle thing (laughs) so i started giving him homeopathic arnica spray he's a semi-pro bowler in his bowling bag and that's that's how i hooked him and he had uh, back spasms, and I got him in a tub with some uh, St. John's wort. And before me, he'd be out for like two weeks, like laid up. I got him up and walking in a day, bowling the next. Wow. And that's how we convinced him. <laughs> if you can get someone to try something, sometimes it's just, just that little little bit of a coworker of mine. She, um, she, her shoulder was like really, really, really sore. And so I gave her a muscle salve that I have that I love, that I use all the time. And then she ended up using it for her neck. Apparently she had like some severe arthritis or something in her neck where they put like a literal rod or something. I don't know. Anyway, she fell and then she started getting pain back there. So she used this stuff on that and she's like, what did you put in this? Because it took all like the pain away and everything. It really helped her not she mentioned her shoulder. I'm like, well, the ingredients are on the jar. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's ginger. It's ginger and lavender. This was in it. Basically. Yes. So that was real cool. So I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The stuff worked. What I loved was um, my mom had a lot of surgery. She's had uh, she's like five discs removed and two fusions. Um, that's just her spinal stuff. And one day, you know, I, I see her doctor and um, he's wearing a sweatsuit and he was like a proper Hindi gentleman, always dressed. And I knew something was up. And he said, you know, I just had the surgery. My back still hurts. I literally put some St. John's wort in a cotton sock and told him, put it in the tub. Just take a really hot soak. And he called me up. He goes, oh, my God, that was so great. What was that? Then he starts screaming at me. <laughs> St. John's Award, blah, blah, blah. I said, did I give it to you for depression? No. Did it help you? Yes. Then why are you yelling at me? <laughs> you know, excuse me, but it did what you needed. That's where the conventional medicine trying to accept or consider herbal kind of gets hung up because it's like, 
you associate this thing does this one thing and plants mm -hmm. are way more dynamic than that you know like you can't pigeonhole a plant and that's the way that the market and the medical training wants them to think of it and it's like one of the reasons I never did a real official class is because I'm convinced plants do different things for different people. Your relationship is dependent on, on who you are and the plant that you're working with. If you want to go look it up later, you know, there's certain properties that are universal, but on the whole, learn from the plants. They're pretty smart. You just got to find the channel, you know, the way that you can hear them. There's different ways that different people hear them. That's a good segue into the question of, can you give an explanation of what the devas are and why and how you work with them? Like, how did that become part of your practice with your, with your land? I found this company called Paralandra. I don't know if you've heard of them. They make flower essences. And Michelle Wright Small is the person who started the company. She has this, and I'm generally adverse to systems, but I've kind of made her system into something I can use. There's a triang triangle between us, the humans. So we're co-creating with nature. Us, the humans, the Davic world. The Davic world are the spirits of the plants. The Davis hold the blueprints of the plants. Like say they're the architects. And then there's the nature spirits. And the nature spirits are represented by Pan. You know, that... that Thing that we think of with the little flute to me pan is very real and the nature spin and, and the davis are very real i use this system and i connect with my higher self and i'll connect with the deva of the overlighting davis of the plants the deva of my garden i'll go through like a whole list of whoever i think is going to be helpful and i ask them what to do literally soon i will sit at, at my table i'm gonna find a table i don't have a kitchen table now but normally i'm sitting at my kitchen table and i make maps of my gardens um i garden in concentric circles because the earth told me so but the the earth asked me to do this and they're um a chakra for the earth they're an energy center for the earth for heart space so it's something humans can do to help the earth through her changes now i sit with the map of the last year and I, I, t I call in everybody, and I might even say I call in the appropriate entities who know more about the business, you know, what the next year is going to look like for me to help me, you know. This is my monetary goal. I want to help, you know, the people. I want students, you know, classes. I go through the whole thing. And so I go, you know what I need. And I work, uh, do I have one here? <laughs> I work with pendulums, and this is kind of what I use. It's a bass fishing weight. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So show me yes. Can you see it spinning? Mm -hmm. Can I do it so you can see my hand not moving? Okay. Show me yes. Show me no. Show me yes. Show me not yes. Ah. <laughs> see that? Mm -hmm. See the differences? Just because just it's not a yes, you know, sometimes it's no, don't do that. Sometimes it's, you know, not a yes, but not a no. Kind of so, like just maybe not and, right now. <laughs> but they'll also say to me, they'll show me where in the garden it goes. I have quadrants, north, south, east, and west, rows, one, two, three, four. I have eight rows. Do I buy it as a plant? Do I buy it as a seed? Um, buy it from this person? Buy it. I mean, they literally will tell me where to buy it from. Well, although I've been doing more and more and more starting my own, I don't buy a whole lot anymore. A little funny story. Last year, my husband did me a favor and put my seeds, my seed box away. And then here comes time to plant and we couldn't find it. Oh, no. <laughs> we did. We finally did find it. But, you know, you it was a well. scare. His little, it's the only thing I get really mad about is my plants. But anyway, so I go through all of this with the, with the David realm. And like when the worms came in, they had me get this called the essence of Paralandra, flower essence. I, I grew up being an Orthodox Jew, not that I am now, but I don't know much about churches. But he was saying that it was like, you know, like what you do in the church, spreading the whole, you know, there's times when the holy water spread. So I'll like go do an area, not necessarily plant by plant by plant. So sometimes I do that. I, I make a flower essence now in the middle of the summer with all of my plants. 
So I have the Green Heart Gardens flower essence that I use for a year. So like if things need an energetic boost or if I just want to show them extra love, you know, we'll, we'll do that, you know, or I'll take it if I want to connect better. But the Davis kind of give me whatever information. I, when that, that hurricane came in, I asked the Davis for protection for my land, for all of the beings on it. You know, if the interdimensional beings needed some help, um, you know, I, I'll say the, the swimmers, the crawlers, the creepers, the walkers, the flyers, um, <laughs> the buildings, the cars, the electricity, you know, just keep keep it together here, please. You know, and it's worked so far. <laughs> I can also use it. Um, I talked to the devas. I did it for my birthday. I just had my 65th birthday. And I invited a bunch of like-minded ladies over. And we did a fire. And it was pouring that day. And a couple of people didn't show up because it was pouring that day. Guilty. On my land, it stopped raining in time for me to set up to have the party. Oh, my gosh. And, and when I was talking about the moon, the clouds parted. And the moon was there while we were talking about her. Okay, as soon as we cleaned at, at the end of it, you know, we're cleaning up. It started raining again. But, you know, I said from these times, you know, please, no rain here. So that's like if I know someone's having an outdoor wedding, I'll clear it for them. You know, so you can do a lot of different things with the Davis. But I, um, I always, always use it to for joy, for good things, you know, to help. As I told my husband once, I don't know how to hurt anything. You know, it's always on the positive side to help living things. I feel like that's a relationship I'm assuming that you've cultivated more over time. Like the longer you've been on the land and working with it in that way, the the stronger the response and the and the answers and things like that. Um, well, let's just say the more I have faith in it. The other thing is once once you start doing this and start getting advice if you don't do what they suggest, they play games with you. <laughs> so for a little while I was, you know, wasn't sure of things. And then I got put on the path pretty quickly. The other thing that helps with that is I have an area of my land that is ribboned off that humans don't touch. It's, it's um, a, my nature refuge. The analogy would be it's where the, the Davis nature spirits go to fuel up. It's their little gas station. So humans don't touch it. It's not an area that anybody would, of course, it's in the forest because, you know, it's just an area that nobody ever goes near. Mm -hmm. And I have like big ribbons around it so that my husband knows to leave it alone because his title here is killer of plants. <laughs> so. I also keep bowling balls. So if he sees a bowling ball near a plant, that means go away. Because he wouldn't dare hurt the bowling ball. Well, it's just, uh, he doesn't see the difference between leaves one plants to another. It doesn't uh, register with him, but bowling balls register. <laughs> so, you know, but he's not down. I don't let him do stuff with the plants too much. It just, it saves us a lot of trouble. <laughs> so when I was new with this, I was like, okay, is this Pam thing real? I mean, like, come on. And I was at um, my friend's house on a lake in Connecticut, actually. And the kids were little and they were all doing their own thing. My friend was watching them, giving me a few minutes to just relax. And I said, okay, Pam, I would like some evidence that you really exist and that I really am talking to you. And I hear, pss, pss, I look up and there's a, cl a cloud and it's got a little beard and it's got little horns and it's got, you know, the ears and it's smiling at me. And I thought, oh, this is cool. And very quickly it got, it turned very serious. And what I heard is get inside now. And I'm like, huh? And he said, get inside now. And with less than a minute, a storm came in and we all got soaking wet. We had to grab the little ones because the wind was too strong for them. And my friend said, I've never seen a storm like that. And they'd lived there 20 years. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I got it. I believe that was good. Like, hey, I warned you. <laughs> that was effective. You know, so, I mean, I do still every now and then go, okay, I need some evidence. You know, I just look for things a little less scary now. <laughs> that was intense. Um, but that's that's sort of the short. I mean, Paralenja has these workbooks that go into a lot more detail of her system. 
I, f I actually found my workbooks in a used bookstore. And I've seen these books everywhere. I have these charts and colors for when I'm planting. Um, and when everything is all said and done, I'd say I do about 80% of what I'm told to do. But sometimes I got seeds in my hand and I'm just called to somewhere else. I just, I just got to do it somewhere else. So I have a linden tree in my garden and linden trees are really cool. The folklore is that when your heart is sad, you sit with a linden tree and it raises your spirits. And I wanted to have a tree to hang things for people I've lost or beings that I've lost that were important to me, you know, to hang on it. So I put this linden tree and I wanted to put it in the middle of the garden, you know, and I'm going to plant it like a magnet that's hitting two of the sides that are the same. It wouldn't let me and it kept pushing me and pushing me. But once I planted it where it wanted to go, I realized that the way the sun goes, this pattern of the sun, it's really protecting the rest of the garden and it's not going to shade what I don't want shaded. Ah. So it knew better. So I didn't technically call on the Davis for that, but they were like, yo, here, no, it doesn't want to be here. This is the plant itself was like, eh, eh, over here. <laughs> right. So now I have a bench there and that's where I start, you know, and I always recommend people to visit, to go sit there. When I go into the garden, I don't have like a routine that I do every day. I go and I sit on this bench with my linden tree and I throw a root down. There's a place in the middle of the planet somewhere. And I, I wrap my root and I breathe and I clockwise send up my energy from this root, the earth into me. I run it through my chakras out to my higher self and I ask my higher self to send it into heaven wherever it needs to be for my eyes good and then you know I breathe in and out and I watch the energy come and go and do that for a couple of minutes and then I go okay what am I doing today and then I get the message what I'm supposed to do today and then I had some friends come over um, after doing this for four or five years they just sat me down and said okay tell me what you do here there's an energy here. Are you aware? I said, oh, you're feeling it too. I thought, you know, normally I have to, you know, meditate and do this. So people sensitive in different ways to me have told me that I opened a vortex huh. in, in my garden. Like when the worms came on the hemp and I was freaking out, that was where I went. I went to sit down with my tree and I just like, I needed help because I was about to lose it like big time. Like, uh, losing it isn't going to help. What am I doing? Tell me what to do, what to do. And um, so that's my spot and how I work. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, it takes some people, people who come like what Wolfers is worldwide organization of organic farmers. So I get interns from there from like two to six weeks at a time. They kind of have to get used to that pretty quick. <laughs> but so far, pretty much everyone's liked it. They found it a good way to relate to the earth and to the gardens. That's my little, my little cer daily ceremony. Although Sunday's mowing day. <laughs> right, you get a mow. I get on the mower, yeah. Do my maybe, mower. maybe not today. Well, no you know, I leave everything now for all the little critters in their homes and things. Yeah. You know, we don't do anything. We we cut wood in the winter. It's our cross training, and then we bought ourselves a twenty-seven ton splitter. And uh, we call that marital aid. That went under the category of marital aid. I mean, we give away a bunch of wood. We go through a bunch of woods. We probably do two, three cords a year of wood. You know, my husband just turned 68. He wasn't going to sit and do that and then <laughs> chop it up. But, you know, we can do a cord in a day with enough people here. We only take down dead trees. We don't take down live trees in here. And if the tree isn't freshly down, we, like if it's been down for a while, out of respect, we leave it. There's certain rules about trees, you know, in the forest. One of the things that I did want to talk about. So the name of the farm came to me, again, from, from this David realm. You know, like I wasn't sure what to name it. So green is obviously the plants are green, but your heart chakra is green. Yeah. Also, if you think about it. And you know what else is green? The color of money. <laughs> yes, it so is. Green and green heart has a few meanings. So I, I'd like to say that we are a profitable, sustainable 
organic farm. Um, and I'm, I have learned, you know, profitable how to go first. Because, you know, I'm not doing this just for nothing. You know, at this level, um, there's got to be the profit to it. So one of the things as a farmer, once I lost, King Bio, like I said, was paying me really, really, really well. And right now, when I went to sell by the pound, even selling stuff at like $20 a pound was a huge loss for me. And it was driving me crazy. Like, I cannot do for $20 what I was doing for more. You know, it was bothering me terribly. So I shifted the business model. One of the things that I've also heard say, farmers need to be able to multitask, have have different ways of operating different products. You know, you have to be very flexible. So that's when I went partly into product mode. And I'm also with product mode, the farm, with the organics, I need to quantify how much money I'm making because that's how, you know, you pay based on that. So I measure, you know, in poundage what I'm selling and I sell to the, um, I put on paper the wholesale price. My other company is now called Herb Mama. M-A-M-M-A. Because all my friends' kids have been calling me Mama Lori for years. So I turned it into Herb Mama so that I could measure it. And at the same time, I started doing well, I started doing tours. I haven't been charging so much for the tours yet. That's about to happen. People always buy product when they come on a tour. You know, I put stuff out like a little shop. And I've been teaching a lot more now also. Didn't have any interns here. I had some two years ago. But then it got into this, I had a bunch of conspiracy theory people, and I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, I just didn't want to hear it. So I haven't had interns here for two years, but I have campsites. So I joined Hip Camp. Oh, yeah. Which is part of Airbnb, I think. So I've had campers here. That picked up a lot. The teaching's been, been pretty good, too. A and mentoring. I am now going to be a mentor. Somebody in Farm Beginnings picked me to be their mentor. And that's a paying position too. The organic school, grower school has used me, used the farm as a tour site, mostly for the woodlands products because I grow in the field and in the woods. So that's also growing. I work with the North Carolina Herb Association. I just joined their board and I'm helping them put together. I think we're finally going to have Wild Herb Weekend the end of July this Hi. year. And I'm helping put together speakers. We're awesome. doing um, like culturally different speakers. And I'm also pushing to have a bunch of speakers who go, who have different philosophies and different ways of dealing with immunity and building immunity. Because I think that's really important right now. Timely. <laughs> you know, I have one lady who's a friend of mine who's like super into bees and bee medicine. You know, and that's not something that people get to hear about a lot. So, you know, that that's something else that Where I do. Is, is this going to be a virtual symposium or is it going to be? Happening? No, this is going to be in person. It's one of the few men and women. It's at this resort, Valley Cruces. Um, it's been going on for years. We just haven't had it for two years. Yeah. So that's like a really fun place that I teach. Because there's people um, from lots of different walks of life that you know different levels of learning too so you know teaching and tourism i'm going filling out the paperwork to be on the asap farm tour also now that i'm set up with like a road around and we got the cone set up so people know where to drive we also have an outhouse we built an outhouse because i you know i was running sometimes six different interns at a time and it's too much for my big my tiny yeah. little septic so, and then we put three plastic walls around it and I've got those um, foil things that hold water, solar showers. Oh, uh-huh. So, you know, we're, you know, now we'll have the gazebo. So we'll be able to be covered. So that's, you know, that's where we're moving. More facilities. More facilities. I'm working on also with the, the raw herbs, putting together these vials with teas in them and a little cook, little book of, you know, how you can combine them yourself and selling them, you know, with little strainers so that they can make, people can make their own tea mixtures. That's cool. That makes That's sense. One of, one of my other daughter's um, 
for the hemp, for the Lucy's, they're handmade, hand blown glass to hold the little, you know, the smokable hemp. So we're going to make them in different sizes for the, the teas. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's going to be something else. You know, we're going to go into straight teas and mixing. I'm starting to, I had, I had clients in New Jersey as an herbalist um, and I hadn't been doing that here, but I'm getting more and more cold. So I'm working as a, as an herbalist. So more state, on a, in a clinical type. In a clinical setting. Nice to help people um, with it. That's been kind of fun doing that again too. So it's not just farming. It's a whole bunch of stuff. All, all the many hats the farmer has to wear. Yeah. This is, this is what they call my retirement. <laughs> so what was like the first herb that you really connected with and, 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 and spoke to you and, and why, why do you think it was that one? The first herb was St. John's wort. And I, my my son was my husband was supposed to be watching my little toddler. I turned around; he was about to fall down my front stairs and hit cement. I grabbed him like a football, and I took the hit, and I broke my wrist, and I was really miserable. Went got a cast, and I was really miserable. A, I figured out they cast it wrong. This voice in my head told me, "Go get the St. John's Wort, put it in the tub." And oh my God, it's what it does. It showed me a picture. You know, you have ganglion. And they send the message to each other. St. John's wort topically stops it. So they're not sending this message of I'm in pain. It's really cool. And it lasts for hours. Huh. You just got to get the water as hot as you can take it and, you know, get in there. And it was, it just saved my life that first day. And um, so that was the first one. And poison ivy was actually the second one. Wow. And, which was interesting because, um, I never got poison ivy. My grandmother always had us drink a tea when you know when they first come out and they have the red around the leaves. So she'd make me a tea with that. And first time I ever got poison ivy was the year she died. And I never felt comfortable making that tea and drinking it. It just didn't resonate. There was too much fear, so I didn't do it. And I was at something called the Green Nations Gathering. We were studying, oh gosh, I can't remember the teacher's name. But we were, he was drumming and he told us to study, you know, pick a plant. And poison ivy came to me and I was drawing it. And it started to talk to me. And at that point in my life, I wasn't feeling a lot. I just, um, my dad and my grandmother died within a few months apart of each other. And my mom was really sick. And um, I'd spent years working and having kids and running to hospitals and taking care of people. And I really just was numb. And the poison ivy said to me, I'm helping you learn to feel again. You're not feeling. And I thought, whoa, you can learn from poison ivy. You can learn from anything, right? Yeah. So that was the second minute. So not that I use it, but, you know, I'm a big believer in the homeopathic poison ivy. That's really been a huge help to me. Um, by the way, it is also the remedy for rheumatoid arthritis and shingles. And chicken pox. When I wasn't completely covered and poison ivy would sneak in there, I would go and take the homeopathic poison ivy, uh, rust toxicondrin. I don't know if I said that right. But it cuts the intensity and the length of the outbreak. So, I mean, I've had poison ivy for like one day. <laughs> but like all over. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it pretty bad. I've had it pretty Just bad. Just go in and down a whole bottle of rust tox. <laughs> well, then you prove the remedy and it gets worse again. You have to have to be careful with that. But poison ivy was the second one that talked to me. Like I said to my mom's doctor, I said, your medicine has a place. Mine has a place. Yours was developed, what, 200 years ago by humans? Mine was developed by creator. I have a little more faith in creator than I do in humans. But, you know, I did take flu shots. I did do the COVID shots. You know, my husband's mitt. I, I lost a couple of friends right up front. Mm. So I just didn't want that happening. So you know, we, we need to work together. Yeah. Yeah. Balance. Together. There's a place yeah. for both. There is a place for both. You know, I have a really cool physician who, when she doesn't understand what I just took and why I took it, she looks it up. She takes the time to look it up. It's a hard she find sometimes. <laughs> was one of my goals in moving to Asheville. 
was to not be looked at like I was crazy. I helped a neighbor in New Jersey. I, he was a mailman. He fell down the stairs, went to the hospital. They said, you're fine. You're just going to, you know, you're tender. His wife said, do you have anything to help him? So again, me and my sock with the St. John's wart. The next day he comes walking over, big grin on his face. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is good. And he asked me if I was a witch and he would never talk to me again and never let my kids play with his kids. I'm like, dang, I just helped you. Because how come you could do it and, and, and the doctors couldn't? I said, I can't explain that. But no, all I know is I helped you. Yeah, so, so if you don't have a bathtub, but you want to do your St. John's wort, what would you suggest? Like, would you suggest like an oil or what would you? Um, yeah, or, you know, you can, um, the key is to find, see, the problem is where it hurts isn't usually where it's coming from. Yeah. And the bathtub gets the whole area. Well, that's, that's, and I don't have a bathtub anymore that I can use. I don't either. <laughs> so you make a compress and then, you know, put the heating pad on top of it. Maybe like some saran wrap and a heating pad. Um, but like that, the, the set that I make and I, for everything I sell, I probably sell five set of the pain relieving salve that I make to anything else I sell. And I have developed it over the years to help me. I can do five or six hours in the garden, put this stuff on and still get work done at 65. You know, not a lot of people I'm hearing do that. And so I use St. John's wort in that um, Arnica, but not, I use, I can't pronounce this chemosesis because I can't grow Montana here. I'm not, mm. it needs to be higher up in elevation. Um, Solomon seal. I get out of my forest. I have a patch that I've been cultivating five different kinds of hemp. And then I put willow in it, mm -hmm. which is probably going to get switched to meadow sweet. Now that I know meadow sweet has more salicylic acid than willow. Oh, and I have these beautiful, somebody gave me meadow sweet. I've had it in the garden for a couple of years. I never knew what it was. It, people give me plants. So I don't always know what they are. I have two or three that no one's figured out yet. And I don't remember who gave it to me. So, you know, they're just growing, looking pretty. But metal sweets really cool, so that's going to go in it, and then I throw cayenne in it because I like it warm when I don't feel well. Mm -hmm. So I put the cayenne. The only reason I can't put my organic sticker on it is the beeswax. There are no organic bee products in America right now, and my beeswax, for the most part, comes from my friend's hives, and she lives on 60 acres, surrounded by neighbors that each own, you know, 50, 60 acres. So. There's no one spraying out there, you know, and it's wax. It's, I know where the wax comes from. So it's not just for the most part a commercial every now and then. And I have to fill in with some, you know, some other pellets or something. If I just need a little bit that way, I'm covering nerve pain, connective tissue pain, muscle pain, general aches, you know, everything's covered. I'm asking for, for two reasons. One for people that are on bathtubs. Also, I did something to my back at work last week and yeah. i've been putting i have a stab that i have st john's wort in but i'm like i think i'm like okay i'm gonna need to make an oil because i'm gonna have to like so i've been coating myself with it you know and it's just like how you know like i need to somehow get a larger area but anyway so that's what i was i use a lot i am i'm, I'm yeah. i tell i even on the label like use this very generously don't be skimpy with that you know, it yeah. takes a couple of minutes. It's not instant, but it's quicker than a pill would be. When I do, um, when I'm teaching or have a booth, I'll, I'll put some out. You know, people try it and I'll go just walk around and then come back and see how you feel when you come back. And it's always, oh my goodness. Because you know, it's very subtle. You don't, yeah. you notice when you're all of a sudden in pain. You just don't notice when you're not in pain. You and then you stop and think about it and you're like, oh yeah. It feels, it feels good. It actually feels better. What? What? Right. But you know, as a practitioner and somebody selling remedies, you do have to mention to people, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah, it takes some Stop time. and see how you feel. Like, give it a moment to register. You know, don't just, because a lot of times people do feel better and they go on with their day and they don't realize, like, oh, that did help. Right. They don't connect the dots. <laughs> well, so, like when you're taking like a pharmaceutical, it's a little more instant. It can be. And so, like, the herbs are a little more sneaky, I think, in how they work. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I know one other thing I, I did want to mention, I think you had that on your question, is what's a good way for people to learn? 
about the plants. Um, and I, my grandmother had the best advice that I pass on. I don't know how many times on different forums online, I'm always writing this to people. Pick five plants that call you. If you're in an apartment, pick them that you can grow in your apartment, you know, in, in, you know, a planter or whatever, but pick five plants. Do all the different things you can think of with those five plants. You want to grow it, meditate with it, um, paint it. It's amazing how many different colors of orange are in calendula, you know, or how many greens are in a leaf and how close you get with the plant when you're looking at it that close. So whatever your medium is, you know, in art, make food with it, make tinctures with it, make oils with it. I mean, all the different things you can think of. And I don't know many herbalists that use more than maybe 15 different herbs in their practices for the most part. But you're going to blink and know so many herbs so well. I mean, for me, I don't relate sitting in a class. You know, I'll take notes and I'll look at them. I have a notebook that's about this wide now. Half of it is alphabetical order by herb. Half of it is by condition. And I learn by writing, so it's not in the computer. I just find it so invaluable. You know, I love having like a physical thing to look at. When the kids were little, I couldn't think. When the kid's crying, I don't know what to do. But, you know, go into the book. Five herbs a year was really, I find, you might even not even be able to get to five. I mean, a mint. Who can't grow a piece of peppermint or spearmint? I mean, I don't think you can really kill them if you want it. You know, so there's herbs that you can do. My apartment in New York was full of plants. I My whole dining... I wasn't even conscious of it until people said to me, who had visited me, go, are you kidding? You didn't even have a, a dining room. Your whole dining room was, you know, two tables full of plants. <laughs> I was raising like amaryllis and paper whites and things like that. All of your artwork or pictures of flowers and gardens. Like, oh, you know, now mm -hmm. that you mentioned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the prints that I wore were flowers. I trying to tell you something, right? Mm -hmm. Who knew? Who knew? But that's like a really good way to learn plants. But if you need to go to books, anything that Rosemary Gladstar has written, it doesn't matter. She's awesome. She has a great way of teaching. She's really good. Um, Robin Rose Bennett is a wise woman. She has two books and they're really awesome. And I can't remember exact names of them. Um, she considers herself a green witch. She tells stories about the plants, has songs about them, along with the actions, things that you can do with them. Those are those are really wonderful. Uh, was it Pam Montgomery has a good book about plant spirit? She's into the plant spirit hmm. arena of things, and she talks about that. There's a publisher called Dorling Kindersley. All of their books. They have like really great pictures and synopsis of things, and they've got a good one on herbs. There's a couple of them and, and how to make preparations. That's been really helpful to me. But mostly, if you want to know about a plant, go sit with the plant. That That's really what I suggest. I can put like all those links and things down below so everyone can check out those authors and, and that website you mentioned. I mean, I'm also very blessed I do own a magical piece of land. I'm in the shadow of Mount Pisgah. The land told me, and I confirmed it, that this is the valley I'm in is where the Cherokee used to grow their medicine. So I'm following in their tradition, you know, with that, make my own inputs. So um, I use compost tea. I keep two sets of barrels running. So I have um, an aerobic product. I have compost. And then I take... Um, I usually use like old pillowcases and I grow for, med for, for medicine for plants. Yarrow, yarrow is a bioaccumulator. So it goes out there and it brings minerals in to itself. So yarrow goes in it. Nettles, nettles is an incredible plant. There's nobody on the planet that wouldn't benefit from some nettles <laughs> infusions. It's got every vitamin except for D and lots and lots of minerals in really easily assimilated forms. Plants love them too, so they get nettles. Comfrey, comfrey makes cells reproduce quickly. So comfrey leaves go in there. And at the beginning, I'm a no-tail person for the most part. And so when I make a hole, I try, if, if I've damaged it, move things, then I'll put horsetail in there also. So what happens is 
I'll tell you in a less technical way, plants and the dirt, you know, and the, the microbes have, there's a, a, a path there. So believe it or not, everything loves sugar, even microbes. So the plants produce these different sugars. So say they need um, potassium. So they send the sugar down this pathway to the microbes, the potassium microbes, and the potassium microbes go, mum, 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 and go back. <laughs> But when you disturb the soil, the pathway's gone. It takes three years to come back. Horsetail is silica, and the molecules line up. So the first couple of springs, I'll put the silica in it, so that I recreate the pathway mm. artificially. But you know, I believe without this, without the horsetail, that's biodynamic mix number three. So, like said, my grandmother was doing the same thing already. So I grow plants that I use just to help make them. And that's your, um, that's your blend for the compost tea. Yeah. And I will be selling this at herb oh. fest cool. in May. It was at the end of April, beginning of May at the ag center. I have a booth already. So I'm going to be selling some of these. So you just have to take the packets and stick it in. I put it in a big barrel with the compost and I have a fish tank pump for, for a day. And then right before I'm going to spray it, I make a simple syrup out of sugar instead of buying molasses now. And then I add the fish emulsion right before it's going on the plants. And then for the anaerobic preparation, that's the probiotics. That goes in the tank and sits. And all I do is burp it for a week. One day I'll go in and burp it once a day. And then it goes, I have a little thing on the back of my mower with a, a sprayer. And I spray that once. I try to get once a week, but it depends on what temp I have, how much I can get to. I have a little song that I sing so that I know it's the same amount of time on everything. I grew up on the Beatles. So I, and I send them love. So I sing love, love you do. You know, I love you. I'll always be true, and that's that's my timer. So that's the leaves and the roots for uh, for the sprays. It's really you know it's my little method of spreading. So that way all the plants get extra love, you know, once a week with their sugar <laughs> and their vitamins. I love doing it because I can feel them loving me back. I just it's it's really fun for me to do that, you know, especially now that I have a a mower, so I don't have to put the pack on my back anymore. Oh yeah. yeah. That was hard. Do you, are you treating all of your plants with that or just the hemp? Pretty much, pretty much. And, the, you know, and the linden tree, don't forget the linden tree. It's, it's a big thing here. I learned about linden trees from Julia DeBarkali Levy, who was one of Rosemary Gladstar's, I don't, if, if a mentor is appropriate to use for her, but she introduced me to Juliet long time ago and she would she would talk about linden trees the city county plaza in Asheville. those big trees that line the parking lot there those are linden trees huh. and i think it's interesting that a tree that makes your heart happier grows right outside of the prison and the courthouse <laughs> and the place where we make our laws <laughs> think about that some subtle uh mm -hmm. helpful so, and then the flowers of those you can make into um, an oil. I, it may, I used to do it like um, on the kid's chest for congestion instead of that awful smelling commercial stuff. And when they'd older, I could put some eucalyptus essential oil in it and it would bring up the congestion. Or you drink it as a tea and it's like, it's a big deep breath. Mm. You won't get anything done for a couple of hours. You won't go upstairs. Won't put you to sleep, but you won't get anything done. It's, it's a really cool fun. tea. Not that my husband drinks a lot of teas, and again, he's not watching this. So sometimes when I just really need his attention, you know, I'll prepare some teas and we'll sit down. And so I have like an audience that's kind of, I know he's not getting up and doing anything else. So I can get in there. I quiet his head down a little. <laughs> but I drink it too, so I listen to him as well. But, you know, it's a good way to set the mood, so to speak. You know, I have something to talk to you about, like. Focus. Since you might be, um, since you are moving a little back into some clinical work and stuff like that, and because you work primarily with growing medicinals, what would you say is your definition of health and healing? 
So also with this paralandra, they talk about PEMS, P-E-M-S, physical, emotional, physical, emotional, and mental states, different states. So I think that you have to deal with everything when addressing health. You have a physical body and then energetically right outside of your physical body is an energy is a, an emotional body. When we don't deal with our emotions, they go back into the body and cause dis-ease. We're not at ease anymore. And so we have to deal with all of these different levels. I so I was saying that I broke my wrist. Um, my son was gonna fall down the stairs, so I grabbed it. I knew there was a deeper reason for that, and I was like it'll come to me. I heard myself on the phone saying, I'm handling too much. Huh. And it was like, duh, I am handling too much. And you know, the next visit to the doctor, the cast came off. He told me my cast was, I was probably going to need surgery. My thumb was in a funny position wow. and it was probably get used to, it's going to be five or six months. And I said to him, I bet him his the part of his fees that I had to pay that there's no way my cast would be on five months. So the first visit, they take an x-ray and they cut the cast off. And he's like doing all this stuff. And I said, what are you doing? You told me my thumb was in a bad position. I was going to need surgery. You're making it worse. He goes, does it hurt? I said, no. And he said, I don't know what you did, but you're fine. And he wow. showed me the x-ray. It, it healed beautifully. There was two breaks on it. We couldn't even find one of the breaks. You hmm? made that connection between the emotional, physical, so that it like, opened the gate for the healing, basically. And it's funny because I ended up getting fired at work. I was fired for spending too much time on the phone. And the particular morning I was on the phone, they found my grandmother's body and I was making preparations. I was dealing, that's what I was doing on the phone that morning when they said I was on the phone too much. And it was like, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of wow. here. I just inherited some money. And if you can't understand what I was doing and why I was doing it. And by the way, I had worked all weekend. I had set up internet training on three different continents that weekend for them. And all they heard was I was on the phone that morning. I was like, okay, no problem. That bye-bye corporate world at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was a Japanese company that should have known better. This was my master's was about. I, I have a master's degree in, in uh, actually being, my specialty was bringing change into organizations. And the people I studied with, help Japan after World War II change their corporate structures around to um, create better companies to work for. So that's kind of ironic. It's like, try to create a better company to work for. By the way, you're fired. <laughs> they did, this, this lady calls me to her office and I said, so, you know, I was on the phone a lot. She said, yes. I said, okay. I turned off my computer, packed up my desk and walked out. I, I wasn't working for that company. I was working for a consulting company. My boss called me and was so apologetic. You know, but I had, you know, my son was, was a very difficult little, little one. And I had inherited enough money that I didn't have to work. And I just, I wasn't willing to leave home on Sunday night, you know, come home Friday nights for, you know, and I just said, I'm out of here. Funny thing, my gardens got bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I actually went um, the summer and visited that garden. What was left of it <laughs> just to see what was going on. What role do you feel herbal medicine will maybe play in our future, looking to the future? Well, one of the other reasons that I became, turned this place into a medicinal herb farm is maybe you've noticed medicine's getting more expensive and copay's getting more expensive. Just a little, yeah. Just a little. Just a little. Um, and I'm just looking at the economy and the way things are heading, and I'm thinking people are going to need help. I can't grow food really well, but I have something I can barter with. I can help. I'm helping the earth in the way I garden. I'm helping the plants grow in a natural way to bring out. I mean, one of the things I say to them is, you know, I want to bring out the best medicine. When I have a seed, the Reiki, all the energy comes out. You know, when I start out, I go, okay. This is your job. Your job is to be the best calendula plant you can be. I want you to, you know, make some good medicine, help the earth, help me teach, you know, help me, um, help me feed my family. You know, let's, let's, let's get all of this done. So 
I, I think that it's going to be more and more important as people can't really afford their medicine. I don't really see the economy as improving for people like us. I don't really think the government's going, you know, that, that we're getting what we need for what we're putting in. So um, I think that it's a good way to help our communities, help ourselves make our way in the world. I mean, I just don't see, it's guerrilla medicine. I mean, it's not going anywhere. They tried to kill us. <laughs> they tried to make it illegal. They, I mean, what haven't they tried to do to people who respect, you know, earth medicines? You know, respect isn't really something that society's been doing, but there sure is a big underground. I mean, every time I think it's saturated, I meet so many people who don't, who are just learning. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. how did you not know this? You know, started studying, gosh, 30 something years ago to really study it. I, th you know, I thought, well, you know, by the time I'm good at it, everyone's going to be good at it. And I'm just constantly shocked how people are still waking up to it. That coworker wants to learn how to make the salve. And, and she's like, how much for the salve? And I'm like, no, you, it's free. You, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to charge you for this. And then, you know, yeah, I'm going to teach her how to, how to make it. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that because, you know, COVID, but you know, if I have to like film something or, or just like, here's how to make it. And it, it just like opened her eyes to like a whole another possibilities of, of ways that she might be able to like, you know, help herself. I mean, I work with a lot of people. We work in a very physical job and, and, and these people aren't like the wealthiest people and they've been beat up by the work that they've had to do. And so there's a lot of aches and pains going around and this she's sure not, is. she's not the first person I've given that salve to. And, and I even gave, um, one of my coworkers just some shea butter and she didn't know what it was. She was like, her hands were so dry. She also has arthritis and all kinds of stuff in her hands, but, and she's like, she's like, that stuff makes my hands feel so good. She was so happy. And it was just like shea butter that I got from mountain reserves. Like, I'm just like, I was like, cause she didn't know what it was. Yeah, like I started selling it because I was giving my stuff out as Christmas presents. People started saying, I mean, I have friends who are younger than me who've quit. Like, I can't, you know, one of my best friends is a master gardener. And she's like, you got to start doing other stuff. You're not going to be able to do this. And I'm like, I know you say that, but I'm doing five times what you do. And I'm still doing it, you know, but I'm also looking at what I eat. And, you know, it's a whole life thing. So moving out to Candler, I guess we bought 12, 13 years ago. I'm down, used to turn down between the cow pasture and the cornfield, you know, half a mile down a dirt road, which are now three houses and a cow pasture. And I would just, hi, I'm Lori, I live at the end of the street, and I'd bake cookies and bring them cookies, you know, my, my four neighbors. It took five years for them to talk to me. And then once they did, it was like, what do you do? And I just said, this is silly. I should just give them stuff that I'm always making. And then, you know, my husband's giving the stuff to his bowling friends. There's a banner now at the bowling alley here in town oh. or mama with my website. Nice. Uh, the bowling guy started asking questions and, you know, just from giving it his presence, like, how can I get some more? And, and it was, you know, it was really hard to set prices at first, you know, cause you really, I just want to help people in here, but yeah, I still have a mortgage and I still, you know, have stuff I need to pay too so you know i also i would recommend the asap's um business of farming conference that was really good in helping me you know meet other people and learning learning about it as a business because i i did that before farm beginnings um and that was good for some of my spreadsheets and and my tracking and record keeping and things like that because you need to to do some of that and take some classes and gaps good agricultural practices i've been through that um twice already I can't be certified because I have dogs that run around and, and, you know, I don't have my fields fenced in, but I know enough to practice what I need to, to keep my stuff safe, anything that goes down the mouth. So, you know, that there's, there's a lot of, we're in a place where there's a lot of help. And even if you don't live in this area, a lot of it's online. Janine yeah. um, has if um, her gaps for um, medicinal herbs online. It's a little dry, but, you know, it's worth it. 
there's always there's a lot of good information around here. Uh, well, that's a good segue to ask. Um, so, like, what advice would you give to budding fellow plant nerds, herbalists, ecologists, permaculturists, farmers, and so forth? Like, from your years of experience and whatnot, what, what do you, someone who came to you new trying to learn today, like, start small. Don't spend more than you can afford to lose. I mean, that's like the most important thing. Ask a lot of questions. Find people to, to, to ask questions of. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. One of the things that I do here is I show people my mistakes. There's a way that I learned to make ginseng that was hard. It was a hassle and it costs more than anything else. Least productive way to grow ginseng. But I have the stuff to show people. Let me save you time and energy. This is what you might be told. Don't do it. You're going to make mistakes. You can't help it. Diversify. Don't deal with things that are dangerous. You know, with the plant world, you know, mints, calendula, tulsi. I mean, there's so many easy things to start with that there's always people who want them. Even if you just grow a little bit, there's nothing like having tea from your own plant. I remember my first cup of tea from my own plants that I did consciously. I was probably 10 years old and it, nothing tasted better. It was really cool. My grandmother was so proud of me, you know, I was so proud of me. It was great. You know, I, I spent years living in apartments and stuff and I always just, like I said, didn't realize I was doing it, but I always had dirt. Dirt's so good. Soil. I should say it. Soil. Not dirt. Find some customers, you know, there's a, there's a big world online or on Facebook, there's groups with, where you can swap and barter. I've gotten some great handmade soaps. I don't make soap. It's not something I've gotten into yet. Um, and I don't use commercial soap. So I've gotten soaps for products, you know. Find find a mentor. Find somebody you can ask questions. Maybe this will get some listeners to contact you and be like, hey, can I come wolf on your farm? Yep. I mean, we're, we'll put the contact information in, of course, the description. So Yeah, I have a website. It's Green Heart Gardens with an S. WNC. Okay. I don't sell anything off the website. It's just send you to herb mama it's got pictures of how i farm and things that we've done here gonna ha i'm working more on the herb mama site and we're gonna put show from nothing to the gardens you know how we did it how we got started getting used to hearing my voice and filming myself do stuff <laughs> um, i'm about to join instagram too uh, oh. that's gonna be a new one for me so um, yeah and i'm gonna have an etsy shop too i'm working on my etsy shop I just can't put hemp on it, anything with hemp, so it won't have hemp. Cool. And you, I think you mentioned you have a YouTube channel. Is that well, at, uh, under my own name, because I had to apply okay. for a grant with a video, so I started that, and we're going to be. I'll put this on there, it, and then I'll have uh, some more things. I'm working on it. We just we flooded out so early on that I just didn't have a chance, you know, to do any of that. Was huh. between the house flooding and the farm flooding. <laughs> I had I sat down and said to myself, okay, what's the message here? You know, what's going on? Because I even asked before that storm came in, the Davis, you know, with the protection, and I was told it's got to happen, I, that I couldn't stop this one. It needed to happen. It's like a, cl a cleanse maybe in a way? There was something at work that, hey, we have a, an easement with the state government. They spent five years shoring up the banks of our little creek here. Ten minutes, it's gone. Wow. It's all gone. My neighbor and I are going to go in with a tractor because some of the sandbars are so big that just a little bit of rain is just sending the water right onto us. Wow. So we have to we have to retract the water. So before we wrap up, do you, uh, you mentioned several upcoming things that you're working on. Is there anything else you want to mention? Um, I am looking for some people to help me with my planting this year. We're going to do it as a class where we talk yeah. about the plants and we talk about no-till and making medicine, you know, something like we're going to do a long weekend and that's going to go up on my website soon. I have to figure it out since I'm losing some time with the wedding. Everything's just going to be on the website. Okay. I'm just planning it out now. I don't have things set, so but there's you, going to be classes and visits and things. So anytime you do, like, if you get invited to speak somewhere, whether it's like with OGS or the Forest Farming Coalition or anything like that, do you still put that on your website too to say, hey. I uh, yeah, everything's going to Herb Mama now. It's H-E-R-B Mama, M-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. So it's HerbMama.com. It's really easy. 
and everything will be there. I'm going to be teaching at Wild Herb Weekend for the North Carolina Herb Association, probably how to do plant vouchers, how to have a record to prove that what you're selling somebody is what you're selling them. And it's also a form of art. And people have been asking about that. So that's like a fun hands-on. Probably also for there, a class on how to properly dry plants. Because that's a whole other thing. There is somebody else that's going to do a pre-conference class on um, how to be an herb farmer. Another farmer. and Another farm's going to do that. Wildwood Farm from Weaverville. That's a good thing to look for. I, I'm not teaching at the um, Organic Grower School um, this spring, probably the fall. I probably will teach a class at HerbFest. I usually teach something at HerbFest. A lot of the growers do. That'll be at the Ag Center. Um, Jeannie at um, Red Moon usually puts that together and has me do something. So I'm, I'll, I don't know. I'm just organizing. I'm, it's been chaos here <laughs> without a kitchen. It's just a mess. <laughs> Try oh. to organize. It's almost done, though. Almost done. Two more weeks, I think. Nice. Awesome. Well, um, I want to thank you for chatting with us today. It was really great. Nice use of a snowy day. Yes. Yeah, really. And my husband thanks you for the big TV for the football. <laughs> you can't see, but we uh, we got some snow. Which we cool. got somewhere between six and eight inches in Candler. I think we got two, maybe what? three really? in Asheville. What? What? The last storm, we got nothing. nothing. Everybody, Asheville got snow and we didn't. And we like, thank yeah. you for, for having me. You're welcome. Maybe I'll do a class at your store, Ellen. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what how to get back into more of that rhythm this year. Because I pretty much didn't do much last year. And what little we did, we took outside to the park just to be, like, safer to not be cramming people into the building. So, But I definitely want to, like, get more going this time around. So. Plus, probably me and Jennifer, once the weather's nicer, we'll uh, hit you up to come have a work day and look at the place. Yeah. That'd be yeah. Nice. Yeah. Please do. Please I'll do. The... Yeah. If people contact me, Lori at herbmama.com, I can arrange, you know, visits, specific visits. Cool. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening. And all those links will be in the description of this uh, video or if you're listening to the audio version, they'll be in the show notes. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and you can um, listen on Anchor or Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can support the show by, if you really, really, really love us, leaving a review for us or a comment on Apple Podcasts. And um, you can also support us with your dollars, $1, $5, or $10 through Anchor. We are working on a Patreon, so when we get that worked out, we'll let you know. And that will help support the show. So thank you very much. Uh, bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. bye. <laughs>